field, I go and meditate in every morning and I was just right there. I didn't need to go there. There was always a thread connecting me with it. So it happened faster than the speed of thought. Oh, let me go to Egypt. I've always wanted to see Egypt but right there. Mm. You know, let me go and see this bird there. And it's like, so it was almost like the the reality was coming about so much, so much more quickly than I could even envision the things I wanted to do. And then it just struck me, what do I actually want to do in the physical world? <laughs> Three, two, one. Hello, guys. My guest for you today is David Hans Barker. He is like the epitome of if Jason Statham and the Buddha and Iron Man had a baby, Monk turned into multimillionaire and now just uh, doing cool things, man. Great. It's a great intro, Mike. Thank yeah. you very much for that. <laughs> yeah, I, I literally started seeing like the Jason Statham vibe. Like, okay, he's a monk and a hustler, but I feel like if you really wanted to, he could like injure a human being. <laughs> Actually, you know? when I was younger, before all of this, I wanted to be a professional fighter. Yeah. Wow. So that's one of the things that brought us together that Aaron did a lot of training. He was a black belt when he was a kid. I was doing training, but I wanted to go into MMA, not kickboxing. Mm, do you still fight? Um, only if the situation requires it, Mike. Well, yeah, of course. Not, I'm <laughs> no, I broke my foot recently, so I haven't done the, um, I haven't kicked the yeah. bag in about a year, let's yeah. say. But I'll start kicking the bag in another month or so. I think my toes recovered enough now that it mm. can take it. Yeah, I think it's like needed though, because for example, too much people that are too much in the meditation, they almost like let life kind of uh, sweep them off their feet and then they can't really control, but then too much on like the, like the masculine grind, like I need to hustle, I need to achieve something, then you also kind of like lose sight. You've literally everything. touched on one of our favorite topics, really? which is mm. the fact that all the best spiritualists are mm. really super capable human beings. It's just the people that follow along in their wake become fluffy and light and they start to try to emulate what they are, not access what they were. Mm -hmm. The Buddha was a bad motherfucker. Yeah. You know, he gave up his money, his family, and he went wandering and he got down to eating one grain of rice a day. He even like, this might turn some people off the Buddha, but he ate his own feces. He drank his urine. He tested everything. One piece of rice. Like, is it even worth it just like eating that one piece of rice? I think it was like a symbolic thing that he was still taking some nourishment. Okay. But he apparently got to the point where he could feel his spine through the front of his stomach. Mm. Does that sound like a fluffy dude to you? You know, that's, know. that's pretty extreme, man. Yeah, man, he's wow. someone that would for sure be like a lit person to run one of these like Yogi Lab uh, things. Can you imagine if you had like a time machine and you were able to get the Buddha mm. to go to uh, the Yogi Lab and the Astana? I, I, I better be? learn some some Pali or some Sanskrit then because yeah. I want to have a conversation with the dude. Yeah, but yeah I'd, I'd always say I'd go back to ancient Egypt. Mm. I go to the Buddha, I go to Jesus, and I go to ancient Egypt. Just yeah. hang out with all of the homies. All of the aliens. All of the aliens, right, basically. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Just be like, how, how the fuck did you build this shit? Yeah. Oh, with spaceships. Okay. There yeah, we go. It, well, it makes more sense. But it's kind of like the thing. So guys, for people that are like listening in or watching on the video or just saying like, okay, who is this person? We're kind of like looking at his uh, creation right here. He's the one that created Yogi Lab. He's the one that um, also created the Istana. And man, your entire story is like insane. You know, it, it's literally like, even just the way you talk, your vibe, it's it's super fun. It's lighthearted. It's not like when you talk to somebody that's too much into the spiritual realm where you almost like can't even understand or relate to them. And they're just like, oh my God, the, the sage, like I need, like, you know, they have to inhale some sage before they can have a communication with you. Yeah, they got to snort some matcha to get on Yeah, <laughs> or some moringa, oh, you know, just feeling good, you know. But what, what kind of like led up to this? Because I think we should definitely talk about this. I mean, we met because I attended your event with Marcel Hoff, Wim Hoff's uh, brother, and that entire experience was dope, but I mean, dude, you were a monk. I was, I was close to being a monk. I never yeah. actually took the robes, but I lived like a monk for about three and a half years. Yeah. And I was never an organized religion guy, right? So I was in it to be able to access the best side of myself, to access power. And meditation was really doing that mm -hmm. for me. I was going into deep meditative states that changed my life and changed the life of my family. When, when did this start? Because you're 34, so you've <clears throat> done a lot in your... Well, it started back with what you were talking about, actually. When I was younger, I wanted to be a professional fighter. And me and my brother and Omid, another guy we grew up with, we grew up wanting to be Shaolin monks. And yeah. we never saw that hardcore nature and spirituality as separate. To us, they were exactly the same thing. It was like, right, you want to be a bad motherfucker? You want to be able to access those X-Men-like powers? <laughs> you got to push yourself, man. Mm -hmm. you got to be able to um, train extremely hard. So we started doing both. We started training hard and then looking for avenues to be able to take us into different forms of perception. Mm. So the thing that led us towards that is that we had quite a hard life when we were younger. Like zero to 14 was the most difficult side of my life. What like was going I was, on? Oh man, like 
suicides, drug addiction, violence, abuse. My family had all of those things. My mom was raising four kids on her own and working four jobs at the same time, trying to put herself through university. So it was a super difficult time. And, and now I look back and I think that without all of that, I probably never would be where I am now because mm. that gave me a condensed amount of experience that allowed me to be able to deal with anything life throws at me now, mm. right? Like what were some of the crazy th things that you've experienced at that young age when most kids are just like complaining that, oh, I got a bad grade or, oh, the teacher was mean to me, you know? Oh, what bro, the, <laughs> the person closest to me in the world being put in a mental asylum and me having to go and coach them through the experience. Who's that? You know? Oh, I don't really want to talk about it because that's that person's story and mm. it shouldn't really be on camera. You know what I mean? Yeah. But yeah, like things like that. Um, other close people to me attempting or committing suicides, like us just us getting kicked out of our house and put in the hostel that like immigrants would be put in that just came into the country. The case um, manager of the case quitting the job and leaving our file hidden under a bunch of other cases. So we were there for a couple of months instead of a couple of weeks mm -hmm. living in this place with like mice and rats running through the walls and um, shared showers where you've got like people queuing up and half the people queuing up are like crazy banging their heads against the walls doing weird shit. Mm -hmm. And my whole family's in that situation together, you know? So it was pretty difficult, but then I look at it and I think it just taught me to be a capable human being mm. because there was a big switch when I was 14, right? Which was that I went from blaming everyone else for my problems to realizing that I'd created them myself. You know, I was there and I was the type of person that would blame everyone. I was an angry young kid and I was full of fear and anger. I was fighting every day and I was blaming my mother for not raising us right, the government for not being there, God for not intervening, whatever, man. Like, you know, I was raised as a Christian, so we had that belief system. And then also my friends for not really being my friends, being a bunch of street kids, you know, selling drugs and doing whatever they were doing and hanging around on street corners. My brothers and sisters for not unifying together and making a team. I had all the excuses and I had all the people to blame and to point the finger at. But then that day, <coughs> excuse me, I just, I collapsed on my living room floor and I didn't go to school instead. I was the last one in the house. No one was there to check up on me. I hardly went to school anyway. And then so I just felt this weight on me. And it just dragged me down to the floor and I lay there and I just realized there was nothing in my day I could look forward to. Nothing in my day that I could envision that would be a good thing. If I walked out that door, there was just trouble waiting for me. And then when I got back home, there'd be more trouble. So I was completely overcome with the fact that there was nothing that I actually wanted to do with my day. And then that made me realize like what created this day. After I went through that roll call of blaming people, I realized it's just me. You know, if mm. I don't choose to pick myself up, of, up off this floor now, nothing more is going to happen this day. And then it's like, oh, that's what my whole life is. I've picked myself up. I've been hanging around on street corners at 3 a.m. in the morning. What the fuck do you expect to happen when you're doing that? You know, smoking weed, hanging around on street corners, people robbing each other, this or that. Of course, I'm living a violent life if I'm putting myself in those situations. Of course, my family life isn't going to be a beautiful thing if we're all blaming each other for the problems and the state that we're in instead of taking responsibility for each other, right? Mm. So that day I just changed. And I was like, I'm the bad guy. I'm the one who created this situation. But it also means if I'm 100% to blame, I have 100% of the power in the situation too, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Because I can change things. Mm -hmm. So it's like we're baking a cake and we're tweaking the ingredients, right? Then I didn't like the flavor of that cake and I realized I had the power to change it. So I was like, how do I want to change this to be a different person? Mm. And that's when Yogi Lab started because it's all about experimenting with your personal life to be able to produce results, right? Mm. So to well, me, that started at 14. Well, it's not even just that. It's, it's, it's putting yourself through so much discomfort that you're actually forced to grow instead of all these people that are like, oh, let me just like sit here and relax into the abundance of the universe while like this yoni egg is up my, you know, thing. Like you literally went through all of this crap and it's because of that, I mean, as you can see from like his dope, just monologue of him just talking from loose stream of consciousness from like a higher source, you know, you're, you're pretty put together, but Thank it's because you, you had to go through so much shit, you know? And then that's what I really want to start this conversation off because people coming on and they're listening or they're watching or even like, uh, even there are days when I'm like going in Bali and in my mind, I have like these limits, it's almost like the disease of abundance or disease of having too much opportunity. And you think of like the littlest things of like, you're like, oh my God, like, like for example, in America, you see some girls like, oh, like my day is ruined. I was drinking Starbucks and like the ice touched my teeth and now my day is ruined. I don't want it. I can't even, you know, mm -hmm. and it's just like annoying. Right. Um, but people are going through so much shit that is nothing related to like all the shit that you experienced when you were younger. And one of the biggest things I'm curious about is, uh, 
was that something that you just like grew up in when were you born in it or were there like certain decisions that you made that kind of made things worse i was born into it but i definitely think there were decisions i was making that were making it worse up until that day when i was 14 and mm -hmm. then i started making decisions that made it better and mm -hmm. after then i slowly became a more powerful being right like i started to be able to handle things and and then the big thing is that like you're talking about you stop looking at difficulty as a problem yeah. you look at it as an opportunity to grow mm -hmm. it's like right now i encounter a difficult situation or maybe even a difficult person that i don't know how to deal with mm -hmm. what is it about this situation or this person that's making me uncomfortable and what can i do to become more comfortable with it and to master the situation mm -hmm. and then life becomes this cycle that where you're continually being given opportunities to see what you could be if you develop mm -hmm. and it's just taking that challenge up again and again right so 14 you kind of had your little awakening where, where did you go from that like let's go now from like 14 year old to like 21 year old Dave what was that's, going on that's a very good jump because that's exactly the jump that happened those first seven years were all just about developing myself physically you know that's when I wanted to be a professional fighter mm -hmm. I was training six hours a day I was um just living like a bit of a crazy person to be honest but in a good way I mm -hmm. had to be intense to get out of that environment and to be able to benefit in that environment 21 I just finished top of my class in university so Ooh. there we go. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to thank my mother. I'd like to thank God. Yeah, but um, no, yeah, 21, I just finished top of my class in university. I was finally confident. I had a good circle of friends around me. Everything was going well. You know, things on the surface were good. But because things were on the surface were good, it made me realize that none of the things satisfied me. I was still carrying this internal pain with me, despite the fact that I fixed all the external things. Where do you think that pain came from? Well, I know where that pain came from because it, um, I found that out two years later. But it's from all the habit patterns that I developed inside that I hadn't at that time when I was 21 had the ability to change. Mm -hmm. You know, I was still internally replaying my old stories. Mm -hmm. You know, my little finger hadn't been transformed the same way that my mind had been transformed. So I needed to learn a technique to go into my body and be able to find all these habits that still sat around and find a way to loosen them up mm -hmm. and make that energy return back to the central system. What are those habits? that you were like, damn, that shit needs to change. Oh, it's, it's more than just like the big things. I mean, but one thing that's appropriate for all of us is like my relationship with women. I, could, I couldn't stay in a relationship with a woman for more than two or three months. Mm -hmm. I just went through this continual cycle of expectations, being disappointed, and then leading towards a situation where I knew that I'd compromised myself to get into something with someone I didn't really care about because of attraction. Mm -hmm. you know and just going through this yeah. whole thing and part of that was to do with just my dynamics with love and relationships and women that have been imprinted in me since i was younger mm -hmm. so then when i went through that monkish phase for like three and a half years where obviously i didn't have sex because i was monkish yeah um, <coughs> you were retaining that and putting it up your spine and into your third eye right exactly <laughs> and i was experiencing that wonderful thing that happens which you start to experience this internal orgasm with the energy being full in your body and that doesn't happen when you just don't have sex you have to be able to learn to supplement that energy and mm -hmm. move it around but anyway that's so you story. just wake up and there's just like semen everywhere yeah you know? those, those are two options exactly either that's you wake up options. covered in semen or you're yeah. full of energy yeah. Yeah. Pick a choice. It's, it's just like it's very binary is this seriously like you'll i'll practice some retention and then i'll literally like, like yeah like three months is awesome and then days like some days i'll just wake up and be like <laughs> what the and then your energy just drops yeah dude i feel like really like do you feel this when you do practice retention so long and then it comes out and then you literally almost feel like hung over a little bit yeah because there's a few things it's like just retaining isn't so great for you it's great yeah. for you up for you in your age like for like a week <laughs> that's great exactly because the thing is then your body stops um you know <clears throat> don't use it don't you lose it if you don't use it yeah all of that so you need to the best thing to be doing if you want to build that kind of energy like the chinese emperors is having a lot of sex but not coming yeah right so you need to retain but you still need to be activating that sex but like re retaining for what like months forever dude the girls forever? get so mad they're like that if you read the, there's like this uh book by montak Chia. you guys should definitely check it out it's saying like if you don't come the first time while having sex the first thing that happens is you get energy the second time that you come or you don't come during sex, your hair starts growing back. And then the third time you start getting younger. And this is like one of the things that ancient Chinese use and the rich Chinese kept it this secret away from the poor Chinese. Mm -hmm. Because like when you're just like releasing your seed and your creation, your like energy, your creative force that actually makes life, and you're just like spewing it on a bunch of things. And especially like if you're with someone that you don't necessarily like love, right? You just get you have no motivation, man. You don't have any power, right? Um, but damn, so three months of not 
having any sex. You're just kind of like putting it up into your brain. Three years. Three years. Three, years. three and a half yeah. years. Yeah. yeah. Like that. So, but that was different because I was practicing Vipassana at the time. You guys know Vipassana meditation. Yeah. yeah. Where you become super, super sensitive. You start to access the energetic system of the body. Then it goes to a different place. It becomes like Zogchen. Mm. You're just experiencing like the world of light. It's a Tibetan technique if you don't know it. So Zogchen is not so much a technique as it is a state of being that you get into. And so when Zog, I was in Zogchen? Zogchen, D-Z-O-G-C-H-E-N. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correct. Forgive me all the Tibetans out there. It's the accent. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> and, and is that something that happened right after? Like, like I'm, I'm trying to find out when did, when did everything switch? Because, you know, you were in this position, you were mm -hmm. like 21, 23. Um, and then out of nowhere, you became a monk. Like, what was like leading up to that? Well, point? it was when I was 21 and I figured out that, for example, if I became the best fighter in the world, yeah. I was pretty good at that time. But if I became the best, it wouldn't satisfy me. Mm. You know, if I was in relationships with um, more of the type of women I wanted to be with, because the women I was with them were wonderful. They weren't to blame for things not working. It was just my internal dynamic, right? Mm. And I just imagined the type of woman I could be there with that was perfect. It wouldn't make any difference. It wouldn't make me happier. And then I started to have these crazy spiritual experiences. Right. Like mm -hmm. I was doing a lot of work at the time. Like I said, I was training four to six hours a day that time when I was in university oh. and I was doing Qigong. I was doing a little bit of tantric yoga without knowing it was tantric yoga. And I started to naturally have tantric sex. Mm -hmm. I'd never I'd never been a believer in it before. And all that Kundalini stuff seemed quite airy fairy to me back then when I was younger. But then I started to experience it one time with this girl I was with. And I felt that energy coming up my spine all the way through, like popping the points on a thermometer on the way up. Mm. Then it came out of my head and it went into her head and she started visibly shaking and shivering. And we both just had this cycle going through together. Next thing we know, it's like 7 a.m. in the morning and we've been going all night. And she's like, what the fuck have you done to me? You know, like we're there yeah, just like possess me. And shaking. <laughs> it's like, it's crazy. And it was crazy for both of us. It's the first time I'd experienced it too. Mm -hmm. And... um. <clears throat> that started to open up different things for me, you know, different yeah. possibilities. Because like you're saying, you do that more regularly and then your life just starts to change. And I always just had this feeling back then that we were all just magical beings who'd forgotten how to access our potential. Mm. And I could feel like this other world coming in on the side of my perception. But if I tried to look at it too closely, it would go back there, <laughs> you know, but it's just right there, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. it's right there. And, um, and then it just started to burst into my day-to-day -day life more. I had this crazy experience when I was 21 and the day that we'd finished our last exams, I'd gone out and got crazy drunk. One of my Finnish friends had come around and bought like two bottles of vodka, but one in the freezer, one we're drinking. By the afternoon, we've got a bunch of friends. They're all getting silly drunk. I used to work at the bar back then. So we went to the bar. By the time we were there, I was already out of my mind. Mm -hmm. On the way home, I had a friend waiting for me outside the bar who was a sober dude or he used to smoke weed, but he didn't used to drink. And um, he hadn't come to the club and he walked me back. And on the way back home, I started to feel this field next to where we live just pulling me. And it's this dark field. It was midnight, later than midnight, like 2 a.m. Fields up to about here, like waist high, a little bit higher than waist high. It goes for about 200 meters and you've got a forest behind it, a dark forest, no lights. And I just started to feel the, the field pulling me. You know? mm. So I walked up the path. And my, my friend's like, yo, Dave, what are you doing? He's all worried about me. And I just start to feel myself break down and cry. You know, I can feel it. Like my body's just shaking with it, like crying like a baby, like more than a baby, just letting sobs out. And I started to feel this wave of love just rush over me mm -hmm. and just break my body down. And I just did something really strange. I just, you know, took my watch off, threw it into the field, took my phone out of my pocket, threw it, my keys. I was just like, I don't need this shit. Just took my clothes off. And my friends, they're watching me like, what the fuck is up with this guy? Mm -hmm. and, um, and then so there, I'm there in my boxer shorts and I get down on my knees and I just start praying because I just feel this force of love just washing through me and just shaking me, like shaking up the cells of my body. And then I'm not in my body anymore. Then I go back to the beginning of my life and I see my life from the beginning, from the perspective of all the other people I've interacted with. And I just realize that the only reason that there's been any problems in my life is that I've been blocking this flow that exists between us. You know, there's this constant flow of love. I was trying to communicate. I was trying to exchange. And I've been just letting my ego just jump there the whole time and disrupt it. And it's like, fuck, that's what's been messing everything up. You know, and I got, and that was just a transformational experience for me. I saw some other things as well. Then I came back to my body and I'm there and I'm super sober. I mean, I've been drinking since like 12 in the afternoon, whatever. And then I was like, as clear as I've ever been. It wasn't like a dream. It wasn't like a hallucination. It's like, I still remember it to this day. And then my friend's like, you okay? And I'm like, yeah, I'm great. And he says, how are we going to get all your stuff back? Because it's like two in the morning. I'm just <laughs> <laughs> my shit in the field. And I'm like, don't worry about it. And I just go and pick up every single thing I threw into the field. 
like just bang my keys are there my phone's there you know like wow. that this is their wallet's there just put it in and we go back back home and i'm so happy that i had those two people to witness those events the girl that i was having sex with during the tantra sex and then my friend cave who was there watching me in the field because then it's like we both know it happened. It wasn't just me imagining it. Mm-hmm. Mm. And it's nice to have that affirmation when you're younger and you're going through those things and you think, am I just making this shit up? Was I just super drunk? Mm-hmm. And <laughs> yes, yeah, so that showed me a state that helped me to experience a state where that kind of dissatisf- dissatisfaction that we're talking about didn't exist. I was purely happy. I was wonderful. Things were amazing. And I was like, oh, that does exist. It's just not going to come to me when I'm living this regular life. You know, I have to stop pretending to be a regular person, live a regular life, and I've got to do other things if I want other results. Mm. So then I spent two years searching for things that would lead to other results, and that's how I found Vipassana when I was 23. Why do you think that happened, that that just experience of you just wanting to throw everything out of nowhere at 2 a.m.? Like, What do you think was going on in like the ethereal realm of the universe or whatever that caused you at that specific moment to just be like, fuck this shit, and just like start throwing all of your possessions away? You like Zen Cohen's? Who's that? Like a Zen Cohen is like a phrase that's like a teacher or Zen monks will come up with to to throw it around to see where everyone's state of consciousness is at. Mm. You know, there's no right answer or wrong answer. It's just something we'll play with to see what answers we can get up that speak to us, right? Mm. One I came up with when I was in South Korea, just before I found Vipassana, when I was 21, 22, and I was doing shadow work to figure all this out, was why is a human more similar to an egg than a jar? And obviously I came up with it while I was cooking. You know, I had all my shit in front of me there. (laughs) And um, you you can try and give an answer, but we're on a podcast, so I'll be quick with it, right? And the answer that I came up with immediately was because a human and an egg must first be broken to open. You know, you've got to break to open. But then if you break an egg from the outside, you make a mess. Best case scenario, you get an omelet, right? Mm -hmm. But if the egg breaks from the inside, you get new life. Mm. And I think that experience was just me getting too big for my shell. You know, and, it break, and it's painful to break through that barrier. It's difficult, you know, but you break through it and then, you know, there's another stage of life for you ready to face. Mm. And I think that's what that was. That was me breaking through the shell, getting out of it and then seeing, right, what's this new world that's in front of me now and how should I deal with that? Mm. And those all stemmed from just like an accident of accidentally having tantric sex without actually knowing what tantric sex was. I don't think that was an accident. I think since I was 14, I'd been looking into ancient techniques to develop power. You know, I was doing Qigong before I was mm. doing meditation. I was, um, I was getting up at 5 a.m. in the morning and going jogging and pushing myself to limits I shouldn't have been pushing myself to physically, but psychologically it was developing that intensity, right? Mm. And then there's other things, like the thing with the love had been a big motif in my life. I remember being seven years old, my mother buying me some cheap trainers, right? Coming home and she's so happy she bought me a new pair of trainers, but they were matchsticks, not Nikes you know, or not Adidas or something like that. And I just remember looking at like, how can I wear those to school? And I think I said something to her like, you know, you couldn't buy me Nikes or something, you know, like uh-huh. that. And my mom just looked at me and I just saw the pain in her eyes and, I, and you know, the tear. And it, it was just like, that's love. You know, this woman's putting herself to university while she's cleaning toilets and she's used her money to buy me something new. And I'm there worried about how the kids at school are going to perceive me. Yeah. And even then as a seven-year-old, it was like, oh, that's love. This isn't love. And then... As things got more difficult, I was given the opportunity to look after some of the other people close to me because they were in even worse situations than I was in. So then when I woke up in the morning, the first thing I would think about is them. You know, are they still alive? Have they done anything to try and commit suicide? Are they, you know, I'm going to have to pull them out of a situation or something like that. And so what that does is it doesn't help you to get over your ego, but it helps you to put your side, your ego momentarily to be able to act outside of it. So mm-hmm. I think there were a lot of these little things that were happening in my life that looked like they were happening, happening randomly but they set me up perfectly to be able to go through this process. Mm. It's like everything in life that happens, even though it's like really shitty at that moment in time, even though like, for example, the shit that you went through when you were younger, that was actually just meant for your own personal development, right? Like almost like a gym for your personality. You're someone who likes to talk about spirituality a lot. And I know you like to sort of then make fun of it as well, but obviously you are tapping into that. So even that might be too fluffy for some people. Let's mm. say it's not meant for anything. Let's say there are a number of people that went through exactly what I went through and they crumbled because they didn't make the choices to get them out. And there are a number of other people who didn't crumble and made the right choices. I don't like to think of it all as being meant to happen because then it takes away the importance of you making a choice right mm. now. Mm. You know, there might be a choice coming to your door right now that's a big choice in your life. And if you say, oh, it's all meant to happen, it's just going to work itself out, then you're not paying attention. Well, then what do you think separates you from other people that would have just crumbled at that moment? 
it's a, it's a big question and it, it might be what you're talking about. There might be something like destiny. I'm not saying it doesn't exist, but I'm just saying that I don't like to, I don't like to imagine that to exist because it takes away my, my agency for myself to act. Mm -hmm. But one is, I think that I was very, very lucky. You know, there were moments like where I could have crumbled and where I was this close to not being the person I am now, you know, to being broken from the outside, not from the inside. Mm. Two is um, love. You know, I think I experienced love at a very young age. And even though it was maybe withheld within my family, there was that feeling of it just around us, you know, I'm mm. not sure. Uh, to be honest, uh, but I can tell you a strange story that might answer it. Ooh, do I don't know if I answer You want to hear it? It's yeah, a bit weird. Yeah, yeah. All right. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I didn't meet my dad until a couple of years ago because I was raised thinking another person was my father. And then so eventually a couple of years ago, I found out. Well, I, my mother was... Um, thought she was dying of cancer and she was about to go into the final operation to get the mastectomy. And she told me I had a different father than I thought I had when I was 25. And it took us a while to find him. We found him. A couple of years ago, I went to see him and it's all good. I got to know the other side of my family and got to know a lot of details, but I stayed with him for like three days. Then on the way back from his house, back to the airport, we're driving to the airport and three of his other kids are in the back. And he just starts telling me this story about how when he was 21, he'd gone traveling and he'd been looking for spirituality and something like that. And he'd been taking LSD or whatever. And he was having a trip on the beach. And then he started tweaking out and his friend called the ambulance to come and get him. But back then, there was a stigma against drug users. So when he got put in the back of the ambulance, the ambulance attendant or the paramedic, whatever, tried to choke him out and kill him. And my dad had to fight off the paramedic, break out of the ambulance and you know, get out of there. And he was just so distraught by the whole experience. He just went back to the beach where he'd just taken the LSD and he just sat there for a minute. And then as he sat there, he started to feel his body being overcome with this force of love. And he started to feel himself sobbing and crying and his body breaking down and him getting taken to another state. And then he went back to the beginning of his life and he saw his life from the perspective of other people and instead of from him. And he saw how his ego had just been interjecting and stopped him from feeling that flow of Jeez. love. And he just described that story to me while we're driving back to the airport in exactly the same words that I told you my story a minute ago when he was 21. What? So my real answer is, I don't know. Isn't it so funny? Because like, I have the exact same wow. philosophy too. I'm like, everything, like everything, there's no destiny. It's just all the actions that I take right now. You know, it's all in my own control. I'm the the leader of my own life. I'm like the action taker of all my own life. And then you have like this other side that's like, well, this is where your life's going to go. And it's almost like destiny does exist. And then my brain's just like, well, what's life, you know, because it almost seems like no matter what we end up doing, when we look back and we connect the dots, uh, looking backwards, we're like, well, man, that's almost like all that shit was meant to happen. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. that is so freaking Weird, man. And your dad experienced that exact same thing. He told me that story without knowing anything about my story. What, and what did you say? Did you share yours with him? No, because his three kids were in the back and I didn't want them to feel like when they get to 21, they should have that experience of their past 21. They didn't. They're yeah, because it's out. expectations. Exactly, yeah. How one old of, are they now? One of them was 23 then, so I didn't want to say that then. And also, it's just it's one of those things that, yeah, they might start to feel a little bit diminished by me mm. telling that story there, but it was very interesting for me. And the fact that he just decided to tell that's like the last story he told before he got to the airport. Wow. That's insane. You must have been filled with so many emotions from that. Yeah, it's interesting. Interesting things. What so, was going on through your mind when you... You're like, man, maybe I am Iron Man. <laughs> <laughs> I just feel very lucky. And yeah. I feel like what you're saying is, is true. And I think the best way to face it for me right now is I'm not attempting to figure out the mystery of life. I'm attempting to make the best choices I can so I can have more of those experiences. Mm. I can go deeper into power and also I can show other people how to do it. Because mm. I don't think it's... Telling that story makes it sound like that, but I don't think it's unique to me. Mm. I've seen other people that I've trained going through the same things I go through with the right training. Mm. It's just that maybe genetically speaking, we've had more of that training. You mm. know what I mean? Yeah, that's just what happens. Though. It's, it's, it's kind of like evolution, right? It's that that gets the most um, pressured for evolutionary change will either be dead mm. or they will be forced to adapt. And it just seems like you've been adapting a lot earlier on and even not just you, but almost like in your DNA, from, you know, your mom, your biological dad and the things that they go through. And there's almost like this pattern of things that are happening. Uh, some may say for a reason, some may say just because like life is chaotic and that's just how things just happen to be. But dude, that's so weird, man. And then you became a monk. 
Yeah, because the thing with the monkishness was like- The monkishness. The monkishness <laughs> is that I, like, I love relationships and yeah. I love that side of life and everything and just enjoying all of that. But then it started to happen. And I love to drink actually, like, like yeah. that story tells. But then I started to have more pleasure and joy in meditation than I had in anything else. Mm. And everything else seemed like a, a reduction. So I was like, if I'm really rationally using my brain, which of these things is going to lead me towards something that's going to make me happy? Mm. And the meditation was it. I mean, you want to hear another str slightly strange story? Yes. Yeah, the stranger the better. Yeah. All right, so first time I go to the Vipassana Meditation Center, I was kind of about to start making up my own meditation technique. Because that period where after I had that experience, I went to um, South Korea and I worked there for a year and I used that to do a lot of shadow work. And what is shadow work for those who are listening in? Shadow work is digging into the aspects of yourself that you usually don't want to see. Mm. Your ego is what you want to think you are. Your shadow is what you are that you don't want to think you are. Mm. So for you to get a more complete picture of who you are as a person, you want to look at both of those things. Mm. And so I knew I needed to do that because I thought that although I developed a very strong consciousness and willpower, maybe I was looking at myself with rose-tinted glasses. Mm. Or the opposite. The other thing they talk about is the golden shadow, which is the good things that you've hidden from yourself about mm. yourself all the contents of your unconscious that could be giving you power that you're hiding away from, right? Because you're not ready to pick up the mantle or something like that. So while I was in South Korea, I was doing a lot of that work. And one of the big aspects of it was giving up all my habits and not just my bad habits. Because how do you know what a bad habit is or a good habit is when you're framing it through your current perspective, right? Mm -hmm. Something like back then I used to train so much that that to me was a good thing. It had given me power. It gave me a body I was proud of. It gave me confidence. You know, it gave me physical ability. But also there was so much ego tied up in it, right? When I walked into a room, I liked the way I looked. I liked the way the response I could get from women. I liked um, how capable I felt as a human. And it was just like, there's so much ego tied up in that. And there was so much pain in it too. All those hours I was training when I was younger, I was thinking about fighting. You know, real fights that I'd had or I was going to have. And all that muscle was built with that violence. So mm. I thought, okay, I need to let go of this to clean myself of those old aspects of my life. So I gave up reading. I gave up um, having sex for a while before the monkishness. I took a period of like a year of celibacy then as well because I'd had the three, three similar experiences with women successively where the relationship had gone exactly the same way. I gave up exercising and then I gave up philosophizing and I attempted to just be as still as possible. And I even stopped meditating or doing qigong. So then after that year, I felt like, okay, maybe now I should start inventing my own system now that I've cleaned the system out. But one of my friends, Max, he had been to a 10 day Vipassana course and he was like, before you start making your own thing, just go and do one of these. And so we went and did one of them together and I'm very, I feel very lucky that he took me to do that. Maxim Lewis, by the way, shout out to him. Um, we went to do one of these 10 days. And as I sat there, I realized this guy is just telling me exactly what I would invent myself if I had been left alone in a cave for 10 years. <laughs> no. You know, so I knew the technique. As soon as they started talking about it, it was like, my body knows how to do this. Wow. You know, I know how to work this technique. And um, it was like, instead of me cooking with sticks over a fire, I was now cooking with an electric oven because mm. these guys had developed it down to a system. So I sat there and I used the technique. And then on the fourth day, when you start practicing Vipassana, I started to have this crazy experience. My body started to vibrate and shake with energy. And I started to feel like this pillar of fire, like almost like moving through me. And I went through a similar experience that I went to in the field, but this time I could feel more of the details. Because then I was down from this thing where I just got pulled out of my body, where I could start to feel actually technically what was happening. And that was a bit of a strange story, like what happened with all of that, but I'll leave that there. But then I continually went through that when I'd go back to the Vipassana Center. And I was like, right, I just need to stay in one of these meditation centers and live like this until I've integrated this technique. Because this is clearly steps towards magic, mm -hmm. right? So that's what I did. And then from that is, that's insane. So you, you did the Vipassana, which is for those that are listening, it's like a silent meditation for 10 days. No reading, no exercising, no any of that. Yeah, but th those are like the details that everyone throws out there, but it's not the important part. Yep. What it does is it's a technique to refine your senses. Mm. <clears throat> Basically, by like if you look at the table, you can just look at the whole table. And then if I train you to look at smaller details, you'll look at the fact that there's darker planks and lighter planks here on your table. And then we start to look at the grain. And then we start to look at the fibers within the grain. Mm. If we get you to focus on the fibers within the grain, your senses become sharper. Mm. Humans mm. are naturally adaptable beings. So the smaller the thing we focus on, the sharper your senses become. Mm. If you can do that, and you can handle the increased level of information that comes with that and not react to it, then you go through the fibers of the universe down to the core of it. Damn. And then that gives you abilities to do some 
very interesting things. So like right now in this conversation, are you like honing in on like any pimples on my face or <laughs> something stuff like that? Like I'm the looking grains? at your, your dirty soul, Mike. My dirty soul. <laughs> like for example, in this conversation, when you take that practice of distilling this table into the smallest amount, because when you see that, you almost see everything in a more like unified thing. When you're having a conversation with like me or Aaron or anybody else that you maybe know or not know, what's like the thing that you focus on when you first meet them? It depends on the situation because one thing that precludes you going deeper into details is you anchoring your awareness um, on activity. Mm -hmm. So if we're talking and we're um, we're talking in a way like we're usually joking, right? When we yeah. hang around together, that's what we're going to do. We're going to joke. We're going to yeah, mess around. around. Exactly. Yeah, that's just the usual thing. So that's an activity on a very specific layer. But you can there's a form of conversation like self inquiry from the Vedic tradition that can lead you deeper into this as well, mm -hmm. which is that you know how people like to eye gaze in Ubud. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There we go. And they have like yeah. a little like eye boogers in there. Or there's sometimes go. when you're eye gazing, you're like, man, do I have any like mm -hmm. <laughs> boogers in my eyes? <laughs> Those are my insecurities. <laughs> well, that actually comes from a pretty powerful technique, which yeah. is transfiguration. It's nothing to do with romanticism or you seeing the Shiva and me and me seeing the Shakti and you and all that stuff they say, right? It's to do with us seeing finer layers of reality. So as we go with Vipassana into ourselves, we see finer layers of us. Mm. We go down to energetic fibers and atoms and all this other crazy stuff that happens. What? But then if you can do that and you can look at each other and keep your eyes open while you do it, you can do the same thing externally. Mm. So I, that's, what, that's when Vipassana becomes Zogchen. Because mm. I look at you and instead of seeing you, young, good shape, Mike, good you know, looking. from pretty good looking, Mike, <laughs> <laughs> then what I'll see instead is I'll see the layers of other information you contain. Mm. You know, you start to see the world of light as Zogchen calls it because we're all just basically resonating light all the time, right? Like mm. if we could see what you really are, we'd see your heart be extending out like 10 feet away from you, 12 what? feet away from you. So as you look more in detail to someone, you start to see a different aspect of them. Mm. But it's like, if you're doing this with the wrong person, you're basically going to be sitting there staring at someone, <laughs> making them uncomfortable, right? <laughs> so <laughs> it, it reminds me of the story of like Hanson. Uh, Hanson, you should tell him. We, uh, so we brought Hanson to experience the Yogi Lab experience <laughs> with Marcel Hoff. Mm -hmm. And you got, you've never done like really eye gazing or anything. I did it before, but like really briefly. Well, what was going on? So you kind of like tell for so, all those people that are yeah, new to eye gazing, why it may be weird if it's like not known that someone's eye gazing you. Yeah, so I, we did the first exercise, and it was me and Alina, and we're like, I don't know what we're doing. That's his And then we're done. We're like, okay, okay, it's done. But then I didn't hear them say, okay, find another partner. And then so I like, I'm talking to Alina, and I turn, and this girl comes up, like, hey, and just grabs my hand and starts gazing into me. <laughs> and I, you know, I was like, hey, I'm like, do I have something? <laughs> you know, same thing. I was like wiping eye boogers. I'm like, do I have something in my teeth? Like, what? She's just gazing into me. And I'm like looking around and everyone's gazing. Oh, we're doing this again. I'm like, okay. And I'd like shake it off and like go right into it. <laughs> but it was like very unprepared. I was like, what? What is it? Yeah. And that eye gazing thing, that's what you do when you have conversations at the point. Like not to the point where you're like staring into their freaking like soul, <laughs> but uh, you're basically just using it to not really see the person, but see their energy. Is that what it is? Yeah, and it's more like a, a guidance system on how deep the conversation is. Mm. You know, when you're joking, having fun, that's one level of quality of conversation, right? But when we're sitting here and really trying to figure shit out and have a real conversation, then it's almost like, how much can we look at each other and not react? Well, so also like, how much can we look at each other where once we even bring up the idea of eye contact, mm. we tend to even start like, noticing yeah. it too much and then we kind of like feel it's almost like weird you know it's not about the eye contact yeah it's about the fixation of awareness mm -hmm. so forget about that eye gazing shouldn't be called eye, ga eye gazing it's transfiguration it's okay. what we're doing so when we look at each other it's like can we go through the laughing the smiling the uncomfortableness and still be aware behind that mm. you know we're going to look at each other it's going to be uncomfortable at first it's going to be weird you're staring yeah. at another dude with a few feet away from each other and um, then you're going to laugh you're going to smile but then can you keep your awareness fixed behind that mm. and then if you want to go deeper can you feel the most minute thing that you can feel inside of you? Like that's where a meditation technique comes handy. Mm. Can you feel your breath here? So you're not even really looking at me. You're focusing on your breath, but your eyes are open. Mm. And as you go deeper into awareness of the minute sensations within you, you'll be able to see deeper layers of me. Mm. But it's also like a mirror, right? Like, for example, there's some times where I'm like doing a lot of work and like a lot of analytical work and I wouldn't have much human connection, right? And then I'll go to one of these really hippy dippy shit and like do a little bit of eye gazing I'm like all right time to look at this german girl in the eyes and literally the moment i start like looking her in the eyes 
I'll literally feel like a flood of all of like the shit that I've kind of been like bearing, even though she might not have necessarily have experienced it in her life. It's almost just like a mirror of all the, like the shadow work that you kind of put underneath the rug. That you forget, but it just happens when you stare at someone's eyes. It, it's almost just like a mirror into your own soul or inadequacies or insecurities. I like that. Now, the way I would describe that is that you're going through all the, all the patterns that you've built up that is stopping you just being fluid in that moment. Mm -hmm. Because for you to be able to bring your awareness here, it can't be doing all these other things, mm -hmm. right? So what you're seeing there is what's Mike really doing? Mm -hmm. You know, you think you're going to this workshop to stare into a German girl's eyes, but actually you're not. Actually, you're focusing on all these things that you've been doing throughout the day, throughout mm -hmm. the last month that's kept you busy. And when you become present in that moment, you're seeing the things that are the barrier between you and that. Mm -hmm. Right. So then you've got to put those things down. You've got to let go of this, let go of that. Like those Indian gods that have 10 hands. Right. Mm -hmm. That can be symbolic of all these different things that we're constantly doing. And you've got to get those hands empty to be able to use them here. Mm. That's wow. insane, though. And then there's sometimes that I'll like do a little bit of Muay Thai and get punched in the eye too much. And I'll do this <laughs> eye gazing. And I'm like, man, this girl's like so pretty, so beautiful. But then I'll feel like a twitch coming on. And then I'll be like, don't twitch, don't twitch, don't twitch. And then literally, like, when you think about it too much, it'll just start, like, twitching. And then she'll maybe think that I'm working with my shadow self when in all reality, I just got punched in the eye by some, by Nico. <laughs> this, like, intimacy coach. So there's, like, definitely layers. You get that, punched in the eye by your intimacy coach? Yeah, dude. 100%. Well, he's, like, uh, I, I literally manifest him. I was like, I, I need someone who's older than me because like in my life up until that point I, I didn't really have much negative feedback so i was like i need somebody who's almost like an older brother that not only can uh basically like teach me how to fight so i, I used to do a lot of muay thai in like thailand before i moved out here but he also needs to balance it with like for example salsa and bachata dancing <laughs> lessons so i remember like going into one of the studios here i'm like all right i'm gonna manifest this person just totally forgot it i went into the freaking studio and then out of nowhere, like I'm thinking I'm about to do Muay Thai. This guy just comes and he's like, welcome everybody to my class. And he's like moving his hips like bachata. Mm -hmm. So we're like doing Muay Thai, but to like bachata sounds, songs. Wonderful. Yeah. And that's that like, like long story short, he just would punch me in the face every single time I was a little bitch. That sounds <laughs> like a good teacher. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah that's like a good. Good. Well, awesome. instead of just like caring about you and giving you love, like had you have had the <laughs> as Aaron's like Loki getting beaten like behind the scenes by Dave. <laughs> Yo, blink twice if you need help, bro. <laughs> uh, but but that's just the craziest thing because, for example, and it kind of sums back to your childhood. Had you have not been punched in the face, you wouldn't have either learned how to dodge, but more importantly, you wouldn't have learned how to actually take it head on and mm -hmm. grow from it. Yeah, you know? if you don't face the adversity, how are you going to learn to overcome it? Yeah. And like Aaron was saying to you before when you guys were talking, I don't think it's necessary for someone to go through adversity, but I think it is one way to grow. What, what are other ways to grow? I think that just being, never being subject to those things in the first place, never creating the habit patterns, never mm. going through the whole cycle, being able to just keep your awareness fixed and fluid in a more subtle state than we have it usually in the modern world mm. could be a way. But I don't know. I'm a study of one, right? Yeah. And that's why it's Yogi Lab, like it's an experiment with the laboratory. So you have to decide with you what's the method to be able to do things best. And mm. I have to decide with me. But one thing I was going to say is, have you guys heard of the 33% the rule? Yeah. Mm. Yeah. No. Wait, it's a dope it? rule. You should definitely say, I'm not just going to say, yeah, and then move on to the next conversation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then I realized, I was like, man, I can't just like leave it because then now you're like, well... Do I, I, I don't know, know what it is. Yeah, so okay, Hanson doesn't know. Yeah, we go. I'll speak to him. Yeah. Okay. So it's basically that you should spend <laughs> one third of your time with people that you're teaching, one third of the time with the people that are the same level as you, and mm -hmm. one third of your time with people who are more developed than you that you that can teach you. Okay. Mm -hmm. So it's like seeking people out like that and making sure that you're in those three rooms. Mm -hmm. You know, you're not always in a room where you're the most intelligent person, or you're not always in a room where you're the least developed person, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Interesting. You're thinking of the same thing, right? It's, it's a dope rule. No, I was thinking about like spend 33% of your time with German girls, 33% <laughs> of your time with Russian girls, and 33% of your time with intimacy coaches that punch you in the face. What, what about African girls? Uh, Yeah, that's, I'm where's, not racist. Where's, where's your love? Yeah, <laughs> you know? Come on now. I, I just like more Russians and like, because the reason why I like Russians is they're like, like when you drop down and you get too much like in the... <laughs> The meditation or like the, the the too far in on the feminine spectrum, they'll literally look at you and be like, what are you doing? 
You're not man right now. What you do? What you, you be little I? boy. Come on, be man. Mm-hmm. Be man. And I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Let me go make more money so we can provide for you. Yes. Come, come now. <laughs> Why you wear yoga pants? Why are you wear yoga pants? This for ladies. Don't yeah. do this. It's all just an abstraction of the mind. I'm actually not wearing any pants. <laughs> it's just. <laughs> <laughs> I won't look again. Don't Can worry. you imagine if you did go down and then it was just gone? Just, that like in the middle of this, I was like, man, this conversation is so amazing. I'm just going to slowly <laughs> just get it. <like. laughs> so, so Russian women keep you accountable. Yeah, 100%. They're, they're like, they're like, yeah, they're like my Dave, you know? Mm. But so from there, the Vipassana, I want to know when did it kind of start transitioning to business? Because you're a savage business person. Like we were just talking yesterday. You were having a meeting with Mike Chang, um, Six Pack Shortcuts homie. He's going to be on the podcast tomorrow. But the champion, Mike Chang. Yeah. Just ads everywhere. Man. Like, Buy my red drink. I'm like, oh my God, <laughs> dude. So much aggression. And now he's like super like in love, like uh he almost had a similar awakening kind of like you. So that's going to be a story for him to tell. But I mean, the way you were talking, you're like, no, we need to understand that this team needs to be a unit. And then you were just talking like a drill sergeant when it comes to business. And I'm like, that's so freaking weird because you know, you were so far into the meditation, the tantra, the retention, just sucking it up your spine and into your third eye and out, you know, your brain into her brain and then giving her an orgasm from your orgasm. And then now That's you're exactly just talking. How it happened. <laughs> <laughs> I was there. No, I'm joking. Um, but then you also have this really savage business person um, persona in you as well. Uh, when when did when did that entire thing shift? Because I think the problem, and this is what we were talking about earlier, is most people turn to spirituality and meditation not really as an exercise for growth, but almost like as an excuse on that's why the reason their life is. And now I'm going to be in this community of other people that also are just kind of treating their lives as like an excuse. And they're almost just doing a spiritual bypass. Like, oh, you know, I'm not going to focus about it because, you know, the universe doesn't want me to do this right now. So I'm just going to go to Karma House and just, you know, get a vegan burrito and just get a tattoo. You know, when, when did this switch happen from monk to hustler from the Buddha side to the badass Buddha side? You know, it happened when I was 25, in between 25 and 26. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't disagree with what you're saying. I think there are ways to face things that are relinquishing responsibility. But I think that's a completely different activity than someone genuinely meditating. Mm -hmm. So even if I'd stayed in the meditative world, and I'd lived like that, it wouldn't have been that same activity you're talking about. Mm -hmm. Because we can meditate, and one person can be avoiding responsibility, and the other one can be truly facing their life. Mm -hmm. So it just depends how you do it. It's intention with anything, right? Yeah, and what the actual activity is Mm -hmm. you're doing. Are you sitting there just dreaming about your life and going through all your complexes and letting them run you wild? Or are you sitting there really meditating? really perceiving things more clearly. And things started to change while I was meditating. I got to the point where I was meditating six to 18 hours a day. Like if I was really- At 25? Yeah, like in between that period from let's say 23 to 25, 26, then 18 hours a day would be when I was really going intense and I was just sinking into it. Six hours would be like my standard and it'd be between those two. What do you do for that time? Are you so saying six like- Six hours straight or like staggered? Staggered throughout the day. So mm-hmm. those, those six hour sessions would usually be probably about three hours in the morning, mm-hmm. then um, two hours in the evening and maybe one hour in between. Well, mm-hmm. what, what, what is going on in your mind? Are you just like releasing and seeing the thoughts arise? Are you like body scanning? Are you focusing on gratitude? Are you focusing on a mantra? What, what do you do for eight hours? Because I saw you meditating here yesterday on errands and there was a point where you almost like blasted off. You're just like doing this. I was like, damn, he is in deep. I'm, I'm nowhere near as deep into meditation now as I was. Yeah. Like back then, I was pretty much just experiencing the energetic formations of the body leading towards dissolution. Mm. So it's like right now, I'd have to work up towards experiencing the energetic formations of the body and go mm. through all the junk that comes before that, the complexes, the basic bodily sensations, everything like that, your physical formation. Mm. And then when you get to the energetic formations, you start to be able to see the pools of energy that aren't flowing properly through you. Mm, you know, the right. habit patterns that we've talked about. When you loosen one of those bonds up, let's call it a core co- let's call it a core complex. When you find a core complex and you loosen it up, that energy releases itself back into the system. Mm. And that's what produces the type of experience I had when I was 21 and 23. Mm-hmm. 
that's okay. what that, that's the technical side of it. Like now I understand it better because I've been through it a bunch of times. Mm -hmm. And it's an unwinding that happens. You've loosened one energetic bond, like exploded an atom. So that energy needs to come back to the system. And how it does that is that it comes back as fluid energy, not fixed energy. Mm. So it needs to dissolve the rest of your body and then remake your body minus that complex mm. as you experience that over a period of time. If it's a big dissolution, that can take maybe two, three days to go through. And then longer with the, the formation process and the experience of when you're in that psychedelic state. If it's a short one, it can take like an hour or so like it did that time with me, mm. depending upon what happens. And then from that, that's kind of like when you got some insights on certain business ideas or what was like the first one that took off? The business was different. It was, it was a choice to come back and do it. And I realized that I'd always been thinking about business without realizing it. Mm. You know, I'd always had ideas and I'd always been good at pattern recognition, but I was more of a writer and I wanted to write things. Mm. So I thought I'm good at coming up with stories. And then I realized if I turn this pattern recognition skill towards business, then I come up with business plans, mm. which is basically mm. like another story. What was the first business that really hit off for you? It was helping other people with their businesses. Yeah. So it's, it, it didn't really work like that. It was more, it, it's a bit stranger than that. Like I, I faced a situation where I had a choice to either go much, much deeper into meditation, even than I was because I started popping out of my body like a, the middle of the night. I'd be sleeping maybe one or two hours a night, maybe not even that. I'd lay down and not sleep. Mm. I'd just lay there and let myself be meditated. Start to feel this sound and this energy go through my body. Then when I thought I'd had enough rest, I'd get back up again. One of those nights, I lay down and this sound that comes along with the meditation was just so powerful. It just pulled me right out of my body. And it's not the first time I'd been out, but this was just so clear and powerful. I was there sitting, an energetic me sitting in full lotus on top of my chest. Right? Mm. And I started to go through all the avenues of possibilities of what I could do in this new state. Oh, let me go here. Let me go to the field. I go and meditate in every morning. And I was just right there. I didn't need to go there. There was always a thread connecting me with it. So it happened faster than the speed of thought. Oh, let me go to Egypt. I've always wanted to see Egypt but right there. Mm. You know, let me go and see this part there. And it's like, so it was almost like the, the reality was coming about so much, so much more quickly than I could even envision the things I wanted to do. And so then it just struck me, what do I actually want to do in the physical world? Mm. You know, there was nothing, there was nothing left. And then, so I thought, am I ready to start ascending beyond this? You know, because you're obviously becoming something a little bit different when you go into that state. And then as I started to rise up further, there were a couple of things that were pulling on me. Mm. One was the fact that I was doing well, but my family was still suffering. And from that perspective, it didn't look to me like suffering, but they would say they were suffering. And what does it matter if I think they're suffering or not, if they feel like they are? Mm -hmm. So I was like, my family's suffering I'm a capable, young, intelligent person who's developed a bit of power with these practices. Shouldn't I be attempting mm. to help them? Right? And the other thing was that I'd never truly been in love. You know, I never really felt like I'd really given myself to a relationship and, and tried instead of, instead of backing out too soon or sabotaging it, something like that. So I wanted to have a fully loving relationship. And another thing was something to do with the business. I wanted to create a cool team of people that were really developing and growing together. Mm. And the core of that is I, same as the relationship. I never felt like I really given myself to the world. Mm. You know, you've got talents, you're intelligent people and you're doing what you're doing because you feel you've got something to give back. Right. And it was like that. I'd helped people. I'd been good to some people. I lived a pretty good life, but if I had to be honest, I'd never really given my all to something. Mm. So I thought, okay, so I'm a young dude. I can always get back to the state of meditation, or at least that's what I thought at the time. And I should go back and clear these things up first. Mm. So then I went back and I started to think about the best ways to apply them. And then business didn't look like this evil business thing to me with like rich people running the world like it did when I was younger. Then it looked to me like the active branch of spirituality. Mm. You know, how am I going to enact change in this world? Oh, make businesses that produce you know, good products that help other people to change, mm. that create community, that help us all to grow together. Mm. So that's why I got into business because entrepreneurship started to just look like the application of all the internal work I'd done. Mm. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's like the yin and the yang, right? Mm -hmm. um, and it, it's amazing, man. And uh, what, what was kind of like the run right from there? Because then, of course, everything that you're doing right now, it's because you did a lot of good financial decisions previously. Uh, what were some of the things that you did that kind of maybe initially led to your initial part of the wealth so that people could start seeing how they could apply it in their life? See, that's a difficult one to get into because that's when it gets a little bit strange. It's like even the time before I started to choose to do business, this energy I developed was just bringing opportunities towards me. Opportunities like what were some of those opportunities? To sign an oil deal between an Indian government and some <laughs> And it's like I'd never done any business in my life, but I was yeah. rolling around with um, a guy I knew from when I was a kid, the guy I mentioned earlier. And um, 
helping him out with some property development stuff and he was teaching me and I was just doing that while I was monkish looking after my mom when she had the cancer but then all these crazy opportunities started to come our way and I just thought oh this must be normal for this guy's world right and he was like no 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 this never happens mm. and we were getting opportunities like coming up day by day that were just getting bigger and bigger like what were so, some other opportunities well like that basically me being the person who'd found that deal and signed off and I could have been a millionaire overnight but I was just like no that's too dirty for me and then other things were like deals with banks people just wanting to get us into different hedge fund schemes, even though like I had no experience mm. at all. And then uh, I started to realize that I had a problem with receiving. I'd always been a giver and that puts you in a comfortable position in a relationship mm. and a dynamic, right? But then I thought as you get closer to the, the universe when you meditate, sorry, as you meditate more, you get closer to modeling the universe. Mm. And so you need to be able to receive and give an equal measure. So I just said to myself, I need to start saying yes to the opportunities that come up. And so then I was like, the next thing that comes up, I'm just going to say yes to. So then someone wanted to teach me how to sports trade. I started doing that and I, and I was just like, okay, it's not what I'm interested in. You know, I wasn't watching sports at the time. I hadn't watched sports since I was a young man. And, um, and I just finished university because I'd been monkish meditating, right? But then I started doing that and I realized, okay, doing this, I can make a doctor's wage easily. Mm. And I got to the point of being able to do that while working a regular job at the same time. And then I started to be able to give strategy advice to other people because I could look at their bigger businesses and I could make cuts on that. And then all this kind of started to happen at the same time that I just accumulated X amount of wealth in a short period of time because opportunities just kept on coming. Mm. And then bigger, better people recognized the talent that I had because they were further along in that business and they can spot talent. You know, you can look at someone and see their potential and intelligence. So they were looking at me coming up in that world and they started to help me out. Mm. That's what I'm saying because most people are just like, they think the fastest way to wealth and success and the things that they want to live like a rich life is to kind of just almost in, in their mind it's like the easiest way but like in all reality because we're all entrepreneurs here we know that's like the hardest way and that is like go to school get good grades like work for like a really cool job and then maybe when you're like 40 or 50 maybe take some of the salary that you made and maybe start a business and stuff like that and th they go through this one trajectory in life because that's just kind of like how society and the current surroundings and their families just kind of like brainwashing them. And mm. it's not necessarily like bad brainwashing. It's just kind of the environment in which Program. they brought programming, right? How come, why do you think in your specific situation that opportunity just kept on arising? You know, because most people don't have opportunities like that. You were just in the right time, right place with the right people. Um, with the right haircut and the right um, knowledge. Well, you hit on it there. It's all about the haircut. It's all about <laughs> the haircut. <laughs> but, um, mm, okay, the real answer. Real answer, I think, is that I did something that you're not meant to do. But the real answer is it was the meditation. The meditation generated power in me, and I could have applied that to anything. I had gold, and I turned it into lead, right? So you're meant to do the other thing. You're meant to take the lead and turn it into gold. Mm -hmm. And that's what I did do when I was younger. You know, I transformed all these complexes I had inside of me. But the reality of the matter is I then generate that spiritual force and you can very easily start to put that back into the physical. Mm. And it, those opportunities now I know it was the universe like asking me, right, where do you want to put your money? You know, where do you want to put these liquid assets you have now? What do you want to crystallize now that you're coming back in the game? And the answer I gave before is true, but there's also another answer. The, the very moment when I decided to come back, I was like, how am I going to make money? And what am I going to do? And I thought, I'm going to do it just the same way I do everything else. I'm going to meditate on it. So I sat there and I meditated and I asked myself genuinely, like, what is it that could possibly excite me about the world? And I came up with the, the things that would produce the highest excitement. And I've got a technique about this that I developed, right? And a lot of people have done it before as well. And, um, and I used that technique to be able to identify the things that I wanted, the images of things that I wanted. So one of them was having a center like the Astana, the mm. meditation center that you went to the other day. And I saw that. And I saw that vision and I kept on over the years seeing it more and more and more in more detail, living it out. So then when I walked on that land, I knew this is the place. Mm. So the real answer is that I sat there and I thought what I wanted my life to look like. Like, for example, the woman I ended up falling in love with when I said I wanted to come back and have a loving relationship. I, I had the feeling of what I wanted that to be like. That's the first thing, right? Then I started to let my mind create an image around it. Then mm. I drew a picture of it and I wrote down things that would contain it. And then one day after we were together, she was walking down the stairs and she walked down and stood and was wearing exactly what I'd drawn in my image. Mm. I'd drawn this woman walking down the stairs, standing a certain way, certain type of build, certain type of figure, you know, and, um, and just an, an essence. And that was her in that moment. Mm. 
And so it's like that. I, I just created it internally. What I let my emotion create a house for it that created an image that drew those things towards me. Mm. And then the more detailed that you see them, the more close to, the, the more easily you can bring them into conception. Mm. So that's the real answer. The other stuff is just like the unessential um, fluff around the story. Mm. And it seems weird, but it's the well, truth. Well, no, 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 I totally like understand it. And it's almost like you just become a magnet. Like I remember it was so weird because I had my uh, my first mentor when I was like 18 kind of like told me this like similar story. And it's almost like weird because people are, we were talking the other day and it almost seems like everyone's kind of going through the same path, almost kind of like how you both got the Kanye download at the exact same time. Uh, but I remember hearing his story and he was like, yeah, I remember I was 13 years old and I was like really into anime. And he was like drawing like all these characters and he was drawing pictures um, and the story was essentially like this one guy would go create like a revolution um, in like his little story. But at the time when he was like 13, he wasn't that he wasn't that person. He was like shy. He was nervous. He had like the stuttering problem. He couldn't look. Uh, he was like a really weird, weird, weird kid. Uh, and when he showed everybody the drawing, he's like, yeah, th this character is actually based off of me. Everyone's like, no, no, it's not like you're, you're not confident. You're not you don't have you can't uh, like amount to anything that, that that's not you, Zach. And Zach was his name. Um, and he forgot about it. But like in that moment in time, when especially like at that age where you're very like impressionable, he embedded in his subconscious mind that he was like, no, everyone else is wrong. This is me. Right. And then years pass. I, like I met him when he was 24. I was like 18 at the time. And he was like living his life. He, he was super swole. He was confident. Like he was a person that got me out of dentistry to really start entrepreneurship and the craziest thing is when he was like telling me a story after like getting it up to, I think he was making like seven grand a month driving E-class Mercedes. I'm at 18 years old looking at him like, man, that looks so much more fun than being a dentist and driving just like a freaking Honda to freaking work all the time. Right. Uh, he told me the story and he said when he was 13, he wrote that down. He said, this is him, but then he forgot about it. And then just recently, right before he met me, he was like complaining about work or something like that or business, something wasn't right. And then the drawing kind of like falls out that he drew when he was 13. He looked at it. He was like, holy crap, this looks just like me now. Mm -hmm. And he created who he wanted to be at age 13. And he became that person on accident because the subconscious mind is never sleeping. And like, I believe everything that you're saying. That's why like, I freaking love that you're like sharing the story because he literally told me to do the exact same thing. And I'm just saying this so that everyone else that's watching this that might not necessarily believe in themselves is something that you could 100% do because it seems like we're all kind of like subconsciously doing this. And he was like saying, almost like you ordering something from freaking Gojek, exactly what you want out of life. And I'm like writing all this stuff down. I'm like, oh, I want this. I want to travel around the world. I want to do all this stuff. Um, and I was like, I, I gave it to him. I was like, all right, here's my order. And this is what I want. He immediately looked at it and just like crumbled it up. He's like, no, you're not supposed to use the word want. You have to be it. Kind of like what you said, you have to embody that feeling and then that which is vibrating at the same frequency will then come at you in that exact same thing. And it was so weird, man, because here I am at 18 or 19 years old. I'm writing all these things down that I wanted out of my life, not really believing at it. But he told me to literally meditate on it and embody it as if it already happened. And it was crazy seeing the things on that piece of paper fly out of the paper into reality within a year when I thought it was going to take me like 10 to 20 years to accomplish that. Mm -hmm. And that's what got me into this crazy thing that is the reason why I'm like sitting in front of you today. It's just like this knowledge of why, why is this all happening like that? Why is it that we're, like you said, powerful creatures that we just forget just how powerful we are? You know, and we're just like blinded by the programming of society when like I'm not I'm not the I'm not a special person man like I'm I'm a weird dude like I was like Aaron just like the skinny version to his fat version and I had like braces I had a buck tooth thing and then that's why I'm always like constantly asking like you or other people that are like a lot smarter than me is why do you think this is the case is this because destiny or is it because I have action or is it just because looking back I'm like man this almost seems like some crazy movie and maybe you know I might fuck something up and then freaking Ashton Kutcher comes and be like you got punk. You're still that little fucking loser, you know? <laughs> you know who Henzo Gracie is? No. You know the Gracie family, the yeah, BJJ yeah, yeah, yeah. family? Yeah, BJJ. Henzo's one of the the son, the, the brothers of 
Hoist. So, you know, the sons mm-hmm. of the family when they had that there. And he was having a fight years ago, I think about 20 years ago. And the commentator was like, oh, it looked like you were about to lose that fight. You got pretty lucky. And Henzo just looked at him and he said, yeah, but the more I train, the luckier I get. Mm. And so whether it's luck, whether it's destiny, all I know is the more I put the work in, the better things get. Mm. You know, the more I build good people around me, the more that I spread the love, the more I create good things for the world to use, the Mm. more of that just comes back. Mm. And you're saying, how do we do this? Well, we all have these powers, right? But we just need the access points to get to use them. Like Vipassana is one of the access points. We train in that, we're going to get superpowers. Mm -hmm. And so it's all about that. That's what we wanted to do with Yogi Lab is just find the techniques that actually work. Mm. Don't just market some bullshit to sell some things to some people. Find what works, experiment with it. What can take you from mundane to magic? Mm. Can this do it? If it can't, we don't want to hear about it. You know, you test it, you work it. Mm. And then people like us can sit there and start applying it and we can show other people how it worked for us. Mm. Then they can all use it. And then we live in a world full of powerful, amazing people where everyone's, you know, bouncing off each other with amazing different ideas and we create something dope together, right? Mm. And just imagine when the world is operating at that consciousness. I mean, it's powerful enough when you only have like five or 10 people. But imagine like a freaking country, dude. <laughs> like the Istana was just like the Capitol building and then shit. And it's called Uluwatu. 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 <laughs> That's the aim, brother. <laughs> And that's that's amazing, man. And I, I just want to like briefly talk about power before we like head out of here. What you've mentioned power a lot mm-hmm. in this uh, entire conversation. What does it? What what's your definition of power, and why is it so important to you? Well, to me, power is the primary thing because without it, you can't do anything. Mm-hmm. Like we said, when I realized I was to blame, the real thing there isn't even to being being to blame. It's realizing that you have all the power to change. If I don't have power, I can't move my hand right now. I can't speak to you. I can't say words. I can't love you, right? So people put, I love you too. Mm -hmm. People put love first and that's wonderful. But if you don't have the power to do something, you can't do it. And love is the thing you're doing, right? Mm. So to me, give people power and they can do everything else. Mm. Also, it's like, what kind of parent do you want to be to yourself? You know, if you're your child, do you want to be the kind of parent that puts restrictions on you and stops you doing things? Or the kind of parent that empowers you to do things? Because I know the more empowered I was to make mistakes, the quicker I got over a thing. Mm. So instead of me giving like moral laws to people and making that a thing, give people power, let them explore, let them find out what the truth is for themselves. Mm. And then we all end up living in a, in a more exciting world. Right. Mm. Mm-hmm. What's your biggest challenges right now in your life? Cause it seems just like life is just easy breezy meditation, squeezy <laughs> right now. Biggest challenge, um, working less than 16 hours a day. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. Well, how are you doing that when you're meditating 18 hours a day? <laughs> I'm not meditating 18 hours a he day. He doesn't now. have 24 hours a day. He has like 40. <laughs> <laughs> He's an alien. <laughs> Shit, they figured me out. They figured out. Get me out of here, Aaron. <laughs> Aaron, <laughs> press the... <laughs> eject, eject. He throws like the freaking smoke bomb. <laughs> smoke bomb. The kratom bomb. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, Smith. We've got to blow this place up. But um, no, the biggest challenge is, is that. It's fitting in the time for the practice whilst also having so many cool people in my life that yeah. I want to spend time with them. You know, it's like business for us isn't, it is a grind and you have to be worth the grind, but it's not just a grind. It's a pleasure to do with people that you want to spend time around, right? Mm. And then I know the thing that allows that to exist is the meditation. Mm. So I need to make space for that. So it's just having more time. Mm. And what are you most passionate about right now? Meditation. Meditation. So not even Yogi Lab. No, without meditation, there wouldn't be Yogi Lab. But that's so crazy because Yogi Lab is lit. Yogi Yogi Lab is dope. Yeah, but and the Astana is too. Thank you very much. Do you do v- Vipassana and Yogi Lab? Like yeah. A, you do? Like we're going to have courses, Vipassana courses coming out soon. I just want to make sure that they're framed correctly to be able to teach people how yeah. to do what I've done. We should do And that. not just have We a, should go, like you guys are going to Nepal in November? Nepal or Burma. We're picking a place. So if you guys want to come along, come do a Vipassana Dude, with us. Dude, baby, we about should, it bro. We should. Superpowers, baby. You want to? He just got a social visa. So <laughs> 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 but every single time he gets a social visa, he leaves the next month. Yeah, mm. I got one like two months ago and I went to Maldives for two weeks and then I just got one again and we're talking about and then I'm like I'm because we're doing like the exact same thing with ours we're having these conversations and then whenever we have like an epic idea we then vlog and then go do it you know mm-hmm. so they see like the action we're not just like talking shit right <laughs> so it's like um that was kind of like the one of the things we were talking about like breath work we're like oh we should do it or there was a we were sitting in front of the person that owned Gojek and he was like here and he said one of his things was he wanted to do like monthly networking events with like high conscious entrepreneurs so we're like oh we should do that because he has like this dope DJ spot in Seminyak 
Um, we have the same idea. Let's team up and make it happen. Brother. Yeah, so yes. that's what I'm saying. But then we yes. vlog it, and then people see everyone's hero's journey. And you, you know, you have like the Iron Man, the Hulk, the freaking Ant Man, you know, and then we have like our Avenger movie, and then we all kind of just collectivize each other's resources so that we can all get to the next level. Right. And just learn from rap groups. Yeah. Don't let the ego get in the way and break us up. Mm. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah. yeah. But um all right, let's Our try and sell it to Hansen <laughs> and make him give up that social visa, right? Yeah, <laughs> give it up, me, give it up. But passionate is like that thing you need to learn in the computer game that's gonna level you up. Oh. So if you could do one thing in your computer game right now that would make the most difference, to me it's that. Because mm. it's gonna make everything better. Wow. Would you say that's more powerful than mushrooms or DMT or not even close to being in the same universe. What? Mushrooms will give you an experience. DMT will give you an experience. It might be cool. Ayahuasca might make you a shitload of cool friends and have some adventures <laughs> together with them, right? Yeah, I try Aya. You do Aya. Mm -hmm. Wow. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But meditation will consistently daily build power in your life that will come out in every area. They'll give mm -hmm. you that oil and money, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, to, let's check out the Astana really quick so they see just like how beautiful it is. Or did we already show that? Because you, you, Is that you? That's me meditating, yeah. Man, the picture on um, the Yogi Lab thing is you and Tatya, right? Taja. Yeah, oh, I love Tatya. Taja's she's lovely. Good. Big shout out to Taja. Yeah, Andra, she's coming, she's coming back. She's coming back. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the Astana is like, like a mad work of art. It literally looks like a spaceship. This is the Yogi Lab website. This so you have to go to, so we have to go there, Instagram. the Astana.com. I'm going to go to the Astana website because it'll have more photos. The Instagram we haven't Ooh. really populated yet. The Astana.com. Mm. Do you have a picture of you in the field with your boxers just throwing all your shit? You should like reenact that. <laughs> I don't have many photos of me on the website. That no. should be the new Vipassana. Just like find a field and just like throw all your shit. Look at that. It literally looks like uh, like one of those Star Wars spaceships. And yeah, that's literally that on the edge of a cliff. That's like, wow. like it's insane. Is that you? Oh, that is me. You're right. We do have a photo of me there. Yeah. Ooh, look at you, you little model. <laughs> Go down a little bit, handsome. It's crazy because yeah. the sunset literally sets right in front of, like, it's the yeah. best wow. freaking view. Look at that. Well, one of the things we wanted to do is we wanted to build a place so beautiful that people had to come and join us. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that Uluwatu becomes a place where powerful people gather, interesting people gather. We all get spiritual and have fun together. We're going to make a mandem. Make a mandem. We're going to make we, the high conscious mandem. That's right. Dot com. Pasha. That's awesome, dude. And I'm so glad. Any way that we could add value, let us yeah, definitely. know. Make sure you follow the links. Make sure you go check out Yogi Lab. Make sure you go see Aaron meditating. Actually, he's texting on his phone. He's been meditating <laughs> the entire time. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just like, oh, Instagram story. I'm doing the IG meditation. <laughs> Like, comment, subscribe. Follow your <laughs> lab. I want to say I appreciate you so much. Thank you so much for hopping on here, man. It was no, a great conversation. Thank you for having us, brother. It's a pleasure being here. What are we doing? What are we doing here? What are we doing? We should just like all just, oh, oh. outro. Oh.